We recently recalled the times we made a game much harder for ourselves by accident. I mean, it would have to be by accident, no way are we doing that on purpose, what with the amount we're spending on premium rate hint lines. The YouTube comments on that video, however, revealed that there were plenty more times when you, the audience, had suffered a similar fate thanks to those tricksy video games. Here are yet more times you folks stumbled across an accidental hard mode. Enjoy, and watch out for spoilers ahead for the following games. Yeah, sorry about that, I had to do a thing. See, I'm stuck and I need a hint. No, I haven't heard of the internet, why? Jensen, the World Health Organization is advising all augmented patients to check in with Lim. There's a problem with biochip technology. The glitches I've been experiencing. We've all had them. So far, I can't determine why. You heading to a clinic? I'm running a few more tests, but since I can't exactly run them on you, and we don't know when you'll be back, you might not want to wait. Up to you. You know how annoying it is when your phone keeps telling you to upgrade the OS, but you're busy, and also you hate change? Yeah, well imagine that, but instead of your phone, it's your brain. That's the situation in which cyborg security chief Adam Jensen finds himself in Deus Ex Human Revolution. And though it's possible to tell your phone to remind me tomorrow until the end of time, it's a bit harder to ignore when it's your central nervous system doing the asking. Luckily, it seems there's a quick and easy solution to your brain-based troubles. Stop by one of Deus Ex's many convenient limb clinics and get a free biochip upgrade. No more glitching, and it probably adds a whole bunch of new emojis. Win-win. Except as commenter Boring Lex points out, installing the chip in Deus Ex Human Revolution is a really bad idea because it turns out it's actually part of an Illuminati plot to install a kill switch in all augmented people that will let the Illuminati bad guys shut down those augmented people at any moment. Moments like, for example, an already difficult boss fight against history's violentest body worlds exhibit. Tell me, have you been to a limb clinic lately? Oh yes, Mr. Jensen. You figured out our plans, but not soon enough. Dispose of him, Namir. And this time do it right. Yes, if you choose to go in and get the biochip upgrade, the boss fight against Jaron Namir, which is already tough as nails, gets way, way harder as all of your augmentations are switched off. This means your go-to tactic of hiding in a corner and spamming the Typhoon system isn't going to work this time. Sorry, Adam. You should have stayed dead, Jensen. He never asked for this. Still, this insidious upgrade is extremely easy to do. The adverts were extremely persuasive and the chip upgrade was free. Free! You understand, right, Adam? I'm sure he understands. Choosing your starter in a Pokemon game is one of the most monumental decisions of your young life. Hell, some of us still haven't decided. Okay, I've narrowed it down to Charmander, Bulbasaur or Squirtle. Those are literally the only three choices. I see. Given this choice in Pokemon Red and Blue, many of you might have been tempted to go with Charmander, on account of how he is a rad fire lizard, and how his final evolution would look right at home on a heavy metal album cover. Little did we know at the time, however, that by choosing the cute fire dude, we were actually making things extra hard for ourselves, at least in the early part of the game. As commenter Terastas points out, Choosing Charmander in Pokemon. Yes, it is the coolest of the three, and frickin' Mega Evolutions render it OP, but the first two gym trainers you fight are rock and water. So while there are certainly plenty of benefits to choosing Charmander in the long run, there's no denying that, if Pokemon has any kind of hard mode at all, that's it. As anyone who's played Pokemon can tell you, Pokemon games are a lot like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, in that they're all about dominating gyms. And the first two gyms that you'll be facing in Red and Blue are filled with Rock-type Pokémon, which are resistant to all of Charmander's fire attacks, and Water-type Pokémon, whose attacks are super effective against Charmander's burny body. Or, to put it another way, you'll be going to back-to-back -back gyms in which you're going to get owned due to picking the poke with the cool on-fire tail. Sure, things pick up after then, but you're really going to have a much harder time of it if you pick Charmander. I've got it. I'm going to go with Charmander. Have you even been listening? Listening to what? 
I got this from Miss Galvin. A long, long time ago. Here. I'll give it to you. In real life, there is only one course of action when someone offers you a creepy doll. Hey, do you want this creepy doll? Ah. See? Simple. In survival horror video games, on the other hand, life is different. In those things, you have to pick up every item you come across, right? I mean, I know it's a horrible, creepy doll, but what if it comes in handy later? That's the line of reasoning that many of us took when we were offered the shabby doll by Walter Sullivan in Silent Hill 4 The Room. This line of reasoning didn't work out so well for us, as commenter John Woodall points out. How did you forget Silent Hill The Room? In a game where you need to pick up just about anything to help yourself, the villain offers you an item. Once you put that item in your storage, it becomes permanently haunted and injures you every time you open storage again. Yes, at first glance it seems like the shabby doll doesn't do anything apart from look creepy and take up precious room in your inventory. Store it in the item box in your apartment, however, and you'll find out it does have a purpose. That purpose is to cause a horrible apparition of screaming dolls on your apartment wall that hurt you every time you try and take something out of your item box. Thanks, dolls. <laughs> It also adds another haunting to the list of hauntings that you need to exercise in order to get anything approaching a good ending. And the dolls will keep coming back again and again, which is going to be a real problem if you ever decide you want to sell this place. <laughs> so our advice to you would be don't pick up creepy dolls offered to you by weirdos. Mike, come pick up this creepy doll. Righto. Yeah. Have you even been listening? Listening to what? What are you doing out here, Petruccio? You should be in bed. I want those feathers. What for? It's a secret. If I get them for you, will you go back inside? Yes, I promise. Who can forget the Assassin's Creed 2 side quest in which Ezio's mother asked him to collect a hundred feathers in honour of his dead brother who loved feathers or something? Look, I didn't have time to listen to the reasoning. I had a hundred feathers to collect. Dedicated gamers who stuck with this legendarily tedious challenge were rewarded with a special bit of gear known as the Auditore Cape. This was a fancy cloak that marked out the wearer as a true master of Assassin's Creed 2, and which you'd be sure to throw on immediately to show off your skill and dedication to picking up bird garbage from Florentine rooftops. But in doing so, you were making things a lot harder for yourself, as commenter in Priral Gamer notes. Another hard mode is wearing the Auditore Cape. All enemies remember they want to brain you. Nightmare. Yes, it turns out the Auditory Cape does in fact have special powers. Those powers being to instantly aggro everyone within a 20 mile radius. Honestly, you'd probably be better off walking around town in a sandwich board that says Rodrigo Borgia is a dick. Who's that over there? So yeah, good luck getting anything done while wearing this cape that you spent hours unlocking. I mean, unless the thing you're trying to get done is get hacked up by a bunch of furious guards, that's going to be a lot easier. The character you play as in Undertale is intentionally pretty blank, allowing you to project yourself into the role or possibly distance yourself from your actions if you're attempting a genocide run. <laughs> Not that we ever did that. That's Jane's save if anyone asks. That said, the character does have an actual name, which you will find out at the end of a true pacifist run. That name being Frisk. Upon learning this, you might be tempted to enter the name for the fallen human at the start of the game as Frisk, but if you do, you're asking for a world of trouble, as noted by commenter Stephen Fisher, who suggested naming the child Frisk in Undertale. Steven brings this up because doing that activates Undertale's hard mode, in which puzzles are more difficult, fights are much, much harder and you can't run away on the first turn, and worst of all, you can only take three pieces of candy from the bowl instead of four. <music> Truly, this is the darkest timeline. Luckily, a small annoying dog comes in and stops hard mode at the end of the ruins section of the game, meaning you don't have to do the whole game like this. Still, the game is a lot harder for a short while, and Flowey gives you a hard time for it and calls you a tryhard. You didn't say it would be hard mode for my feelings as well, Undertale. Oh. <laughs> 
Prior to the release of Supernatural Assassin Simulator Dishonored, much was made about how whether you enjoyed being stealthy and silent or noisy and violent, there was no wrong way to play the game. Except that when people actually got hold of Dishonored, it turned out that there definitely was a wrong way to play the game. That's all down to the game's chaos system, which assigns you a chaos level based on how violently and recklessly you play. As commenter Namacub95 says, No mention of Dishonored and the high chaos world state? Weepers are suddenly everywhere in the later levels just because you decided your enemies needed that shanking. Yes, as Namacub states, often in Dishonored you'll decide that your enemies need a shanking. However, do that too often and it'll raise your chaos level, which will start to affect the world in ways that are definitely not beneficial to you remaining alive and undetected. A high chaos level increases the number of guards, the amount of rats you'll encounter, and worst of all, the number of weepers you'll come across. Weepers being the gross shambling plague zombies that, if you get too close to them, will grab and vomit all over you. Charming. This makes stealth much harder because there are loads more enemies around to detect you, which means you'll have to engage in combat more often, which means you'll kill more people, which means more chaos, which means more enemies, and so on, until presumably you're able to crowd surf to your assassination targets across a horde of weepers, rats, and very confused guards. Also, it means you get the bad ending as well. The city's feeding on itself now. Liars and merchants and nobles, like maggots on a carcass. Soon will be nothing left for the rats. Yes, we've given you the ability to teleport across the room and stab someone in the face, but please don't do that. Thanks. Star Ocean The Second Story is a late 90s PlayStation RPG that included a mechanic called Private Actions, which sounds much ruder than it actually is. What these Private Actions actually are, are the equivalent of RPG Shore Leave, in which your party visits a town, does some shopping, gets some R&R, &R, and chats to each other, influencing their relationships to give you positive bonuses in battle. Or, as is the case with one character you come across, make the final boss an absolute nightmare as according to commenter Kenta Midderin. That face when you accidentally release the limiter for the last boss of Star Ocean 2, just by following a mysterious girl. Welp. The mysterious girl in question is Philia. Turns out Philia is the daughter of the final boss, Gabriel, and acts as a limiter on his power in the final battle. However, triggering both of Philia's private actions leads to Gabriel killing her and removing the limiter on his powers. Meaning that in the final boss fight, Gabriel, now known as Indalecio, has 1.5 million hit points, three times what he has if you just ignore Philia. He also has double the usual amount of magic points and presumably is in a really bad mood having just killed his own daughter. Tortured to death. Crest of Annihilation, yeah, I'm going to say bad mood. Anyway, look forward to getting owned in this boss fight, which is now approximately three times harder, all thanks to the fact that you're a bit chatty and enjoy talking to people. Talking to people who aren't Gabriel, that is. Honestly, it's just annihilation, annihilation, annihilation with that guy. Those are some of the times that you accidentally activated a hard mode in video games. But if you've got some more suggestions that didn't make it into this video, please do put them in the comments below. And if you want to watch more videos, up here we've got a video from us which is about levels that you get in basically every game. I know what you're thinking, water level, it's in there, check it out. And under here is a video from Outside Extra which is about video game bosses who just had to sing. Check it out, some good stuff in there. <laughs>